Hello everyone. This is one of many videos that I'll be doing on enzymes and their basic principles. Now, enzymes as a topic features in numerous areas of a syllabus at various key stages and it's done from a fairly basic level when looking at digestion in key stage three all the way up to the enzymes used in respiration and photosynthesis at A level and IB. So what I'm going to really do is cover kind of the whole range of information and I'm going to outline on each video what I'm going to be talking about in them. So the basic principles I'm going to look at today in this video are the general structure and function, the induced fit model, enzymes in relation to activation energy and what we mean by that, and then we'll finish off by looking at the factors affecting enzyme activity. So let's think about some of the basics first of all. Enzymes are globular protein molecules that accelerate specific reactions. That is, that is their job, if you like. So they're globular protein molecules that accelerate specific reactions. In fact, I'm just going to make a little note here, because that's really the key thing. that They accelerate specific Reactions. Now, I'm not going to write necessarily write down everything I say, but just some key things. Now, they are a type of catalyst in that they speed up reactions without actually changing the products or equilibrium of the reaction. So basically, they act as a catalyst. So they speed up reactions without changing the products or being used themselves. And they are substrate specific. Now, I'm just going to draw a very simple sketch of something here. Let's say, for example, here is our, I'll just colour this in, here is our enzyme. Now, I know at key stage 3, I often show like a very simplistic diagram like this to represent the enzyme. And here could be, we'll colour that in red, this could be what we call the substrate. Now the substrate is what the enzyme acts on, what the enzyme will go to break down. Now we say that enzymes are substrate specific and that relates to the lock and key model. So we've always said that one substrate will only fit into one enzyme if you like and quite clearly you can see that these shapes correspond. Now the region that I'm going to highlight here in purple on this enzyme here. This region here, that is called the active site. And we say that that substrate will bind to the enzyme at the active site and it forms what is called an enzyme substrate complex or what's known as an ES complex an enzyme substrate complex when that substrate goes into the enzyme. Now enzyme specificity is determined by that active site. It's where that substrate will bind. Now it's not rigid but it is specific enough to recognize only one substrate and that is created by the tertiary and quaternary levels of protein organization. So Enzymes are ultimately proteins and in another video I'll talk about protein and protein structure and we'll say how you go from ultimately a, an amino acid polypeptide chain into a full globular protein like enzymes are. So when we look at enzymes we're thinking of proteins in their tertiary or quaternary, their third or fourth level structure. So the enzymes are ultimately proteins. Now when the substrate enters the active site, it actually induces the enzyme to slightly change its shape, to fit more snugly if you like, and it's called the induced fit model. It's a slight extension of the lock and key idea. And that's what I'm going to move on to. So I've said that in terms of general structure and function that enzymes are basic proteins in a at a tertiary or quaternary level, their job is to speed up reactions and act as a catalyst and not be being used up themselves. But now I'm going to look at this induced fit model idea because in school we're used to this lock and key, so this substrate fit has to fit that shape 
the active site perfectly or nothing happens. Now we've got this idea that the enzyme can adapt and change slightly. But one thing I must say, and one key thing to remember, is that metabolic pathways, so reactions in our body, consist of chains and cycles of enzyme-catalyzed reactions. Enzymes are critical to these metabolic pathways. So let's look at this induced fit model. So let's say if we draw a diagram over to the right hand side, let's say here's our enzyme. We'll colour this in blue again. So we've got our enzyme here. And I'll just label on it this active site. And we're going to imagine this time now we have a substrate that looks a bit like this. My colour in green. So it's got this sort of circular portion with this random triangle bit. Now again, this is just a, a diagram, just a, a visualization of this induced fit model. So here in green is our substrate. Now what we say is that this substrate will enter the active site of the enzyme. And now what we end up with is something that looks a bit like this. And you can see just from my drawing that this kind of goes against the normal lock and key mechanism idea. This is more the induced fit model. You can see that the enzyme has kind of adapted, if you like, or altered its shape to accommodate that substrate only slightly. So we can see the shape of the active site has changed. This substrate has bound to the enzyme to form an enzyme substrate complex. And then I draw this in another colour, we see that over time, once the enzyme works and does its job, we then, if I colour this in a separate colour, we then get an enzyme product complex, so this enzyme has acted on the substrate, and then eventually what we'd end up with are these substrates or this substrate rather being released from this enzyme and it would look something like this. So substrate binds to the active site, active site changes slightly to make it fit to form an ES complex. Enzyme products complex is then formed when the substrate is broken down and that's what I've represented by this little purple triangle to show that substrate is broken into its separate products. And then those substrate, or that, those products rather, have left the active site, been released from the enzyme. Now that is the basic induced fit model. So at the top, and I refer to the induced fit model, that's what I've just drawn here. So it suggests we slightly change the shape of the active site to fit the substrate. But the principle, the basic principle is still the same. We're still going to speed up specific reactions and it still is a substrate specific protein that we are using to do it. So let's look at this third of the, of the principles that I was going to look at in this video, this idea of activation energy. Now for this I think we'll just reduce the screen a little bit here and we'll just move this up to the top because I want to keep it all on one slide if you like. So I'm going to draw a graph with the scale here and we're going to have up the side energy. So we've got energy here and along the bottom we'll just call this A reaction coordinate if you like. Now on this scale we need to draw in a, f a few particular labels. 
this one here, this one here, and one here. And I'm going to draw two graphs. Now the easiest way I think to explain this is to draw the graphs and then explain what it is I've drawn. So I want two graphs here, the one in red. And one in blue. Now the one in red represents without a reaction without an enzyme and the one in blue represents with, so with an enzyme. Now if two molecules are going to react with each other they must collide at a certain rate. So there is no reaction unless they collide at this rate. And the higher the activation energy, the higher the required speed needed. So activation energy, if you like, is the energy needed to start a reaction. And those particles or molecules that are going to collide must have a high enough speed. They must get over that activation energy to start this reaction. Now, enzymes reduce the required activation energy. So enzymes help with that process so that we don't need them at such a high speed to get them to collide. And the active site facilitates the chemical change. So what we have here, if I now go back to this graph and add the labels, this section here is the activation energy, if I just call that A with an A dot E for activation energy, that is the activation energy with the enzyme. This here, if I draw a line from the middle line to the bottom, that is the activation energy without, and you can really quickly see from the curve that the red line is going much steeper, much higher up than the blue one. There's a greater barrier to overcome, if you like. We're having to push the energy level much, much higher just to get the reaction to begin. Now, I've drawn a graph that's quite distinct because in it, and I'll use a green line to show this, I've drawn a graph representing an exothermic reaction, one where energy is released. So that's why this energy level overall appears to go down. So this bit here is the overall energy released during the reaction. So I've drawn the graph of an exothermic reaction. That's why it's going less or appears to go lower than our starting energy point. But it's quite clear to see from this graph that without the enzyme we're having to overcome a greater activation energy then with the enzyme. So we're not needing such a high speed to get particles to collide, therefore we're more likely to get a successful reaction. And a good example, if I were to give an example of a, a reaction to, to go with this graph that I've drawn, if we think of reactants, reactants at the start, so we could have uh, C6, H12, O6 and O2, so glucose and oxygen. And at the end, our products could be CO2 and H2O, carbon dioxide and water. So there's an example of an exothermic reaction where we're releasing energy. This formula is respiration that I'm referring to. So we start with glucose and oxygen, we end up with carbon dioxide and water, we release energy. So this is the very typical graph that you would see for that reaction. And that with enzymes, our activation energy is lowered. So we're more likely to get molecules successfully colliding and reacting together. So, I'm going to finish this video now on enzyme basic principles by looking at the factors that affect enzyme activity. Now what I want to do is just put a definition in here for us to look at. Now what this definition says is the rate of reaction is the amount of a substrate changed or the product formed in a given period of time. That's how we define the rate of a reaction. And there are four variables, four things in an enzyme-catalyzed reaction that can affect that rate. 
They are temperature, pH, the enzyme concentration and the substrate concentration. So what I'm going to do is just look at those four things on the next part of the video. So what we've got here are four very simplistic graphs to show the effect of these variables on an enzyme catalyzed reaction. So let's start in the top left. So with temperature, we can see that as the temperature rises, so too does the rate. We've got a sort of peak at about 40, and then the temperature rise beyond that appears to cause the rate of reaction to decline. Now, remember an enzyme is a protein. If you heat the protein above an optimal temperature, and that peak is called the optimum, so if you heat the protein above the optimal temperature, bonds break, meaning that the protein loses its secondary and tertiary structure. Now, an increase in temperature can increase activity by increasing the number of collisions between active sites and substrates. So when the temperature goes up, you're providing more energy, if you like, to the enzyme and to the substrate, and they're going to collide more frequently. So the rate of reaction does increase. But if the temperature increases too much, we say that the enzyme will denature. And that's a key word to just make a note of here. So beyond 40, what we have is something called denaturation. I talk about it over when I look at pH, but I'm just going to mention it again here. Now, the active site in that case starts to change shape and it will no longer fit the substrate that it's meant to. So it no longer functions like it should. Now, most enzyme substrate interactions have temperature thresholds. For example, a typical human enzyme has an optimal temperature of about 35 to 40 degrees Celsius. After that, the reaction rate would sharply go down and decrease. Now, similar for pH. With pH, most enzyme catalyzed reactions have a very narrow pH optima. So they work in very narrow ranges. So you can see we've got two ranges shown on this pH graph. Now, outside of that optima, or optimal pH range for the enzyme, or the substrate even, we can start to disrupt ionic bonds and we alter the structure again of the enzyme. And we can actually affect the charge residues at the active site. And like I said with temperature, we once again get enzyme denaturation. And I've put a little bit more about it in the box there. So proteins unravel, lose their original conformation, typically caused by extremes of temperature and extremes of or levels of pH that are unfavorable and it renders the protein ultimately inactive. So pH and temperature have a very notable effect on enzyme catalyzed reactions and can lead to the enzyme being denatured, which renders it ineffective, almost like destroying it. But then we've got two other factors that are quite unusual. When we increase the enzyme concentration, we can see the rate of reaction increases. We have a directly proportional relationship and that continues. So as the enzyme concentration goes up, so too does the rate of reaction. But when we look at the substrate concentration, we do have this proportional relationship at the beginning, but then there's this plateau, this flat part here on the graph. And that is because, as I've said, active sites are full. There's only a maximum amount of enzyme that we can fill. So if the substrate concentration actually increases too much, the reaction rate will plateau much quicker. So you can overload this reaction with lots of substrate, but if your enzyme concentration is fixed and it's the same, we can only fill a certain number of active sites. So the reaction rate, while still continuing, will just plateau. It will, it will reach a particular point and will go no quicker or no slower. So there we have four variables that affect enzyme reactions. Temperature, pH, enzyme concentration and substrate concentration. And they are some basic principles to do with enzymes. In the second of these videos I'm going to make, I'll be talking about enzyme inhibitors, competitive and non-competitive enzyme inhibitors, and something called allosteric enzymes. Okay, I hope all that helps.